We'll call this meeting of the New Plow City Council to order. Welcome the administration, fellow council members, and members of the audience. Also, we are privileged to have the Tecumseh Levy Committee here with us. And I believe we got a little discussion coming from them very shortly. With that, Mrs. Burner. Mayor Cook. Yes. Councilman Bond. Yes. Councilman Shammy. Here. Councilwoman Wright. Here. Councilman Lindsay. Here. Count Vice Mayor Eggleston. Here. Six members present. With that, the invocation will be by Chief Trustee. Oh, Lord, we thank you for this day, the beautiful weather, and the wonderful summer. We pray that you please be in this meeting tonight. Let thy perfect will death be done. And please be with the Grimm family and ceremony in this loss, Father. We give you all the glory and the praise and the thanks, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And with that, I think I need a motion in regards to the minutes of 715. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any comments? If not, Mrs. Burner. Mayor Cook? Yes. Councilman Bond? Yes. Councilman Shammy? Yes. Councilwoman Wright? Yes. Councilman Lindsay? Yes. Vice Mayor Eggleston? Yes. Minutes accepted 6 0. And with that, the next item on the agenda is the fact that we do have a vacancy here on City Council. Basically, our charter alludes to the fact that Council shall provide timely notice of such vacancy at their next regular Council meeting, which is this one. Such a vacancy shall be filled for the remainder of the unexpired term, which is a little over three years. The public may go to the city's website. There's an application on there to become a member of the council. And we have 10 days from the publication of the notice of the case vacancy to appoint a qualified person. With that, uh, I still do not know of any uh, arrangements for Mr. Grimm. He did pass away, I believe it was 5.45 Saturday evening. So we're still awaiting those arrangements to find out uh, if and when. I do understand that he has been, uh, or the family is being served by Adkins Funeral Home out of Enon. So unless I know something later on, which I will let council and the administration know. Other than that, Mr. Mills, we're gonna let you be up. Good evening, everyone. Um, I get the privilege tonight to uh, tantalize your senses and your, uh, for your enjoyment the uh, wonders of school finance and levy information. So um, I would like to thank the council, administrators, and members of the public for allowing me the opportunity to speak. Um, we are one community, even though we have small, separate organizations. Um, and you know this opportunity to collaborate together as a group and provide this presentation is greatly um, thanked. So I really do appreciate it. Um, so real quick introduction and some disclaimers. Um, my name is Matthew Mills. For those of you, that, those of you who do not know me, um, I am a sitting member on the Board of Education of Tecumseh Local Schools. But tonight I am speaking as a private citizen and the president of the Levy Committee. Also in the audience today, we have Susan Weil, who is the treasurer for the Tecumseh Levy Committee. 
We have several um, staff members. Um, we have Paula Peru, Superintendent, and Denise Robinson, the treasurer for the district. We have a couple of board members as well, um, just here. Um, the intent at the end of this meeting is to let you guys ask questions. I did give you guys copies of the presentation with a place to take notes as we go along. I'll try and make this as quick as I can. Um, a couple other just quick housekeeping items. We do have a levy committee meeting on April, not April, I'm sorry, August 14th. Uh, it's at the Tecumseh High School in the Aero Conference Room. It's at 5 p.m. I would encourage anyone and all to attend um, after this meeting just to get more facts and to get involved with the uh, levy committee process. We do have a Facebook page. Uh, you can find it on Vote for Tecumseh Schools. If you're not following it currently, I'd ask you to do so. And then we do have an email, uh, vote for Tecumseh Schools at gmail.com, should you guys have any questions or require any additional information. So with that, um, this presentation is going to be kind of broken up into a couple of different parts. Um, one, I'm going to talk about the levies that Tecumseh has on the books. I'm going to talk about um, the different types of levies that they are. A lot of people don't understand how schools are financed and the different levies and what they mean. Um, I'm going to talk about some cost saving measures the district has done over the past 15, 20 years. And then I'm going to talk about the levies that are going to be on the uh, November ballot. Um, and the reason why I'm mainly here is to provide some factual information on those levies and the need for them. Uh, so first thing, um, this is in the state constitution. It was passed in 1976 that every school district, public school district in the state of Ohio has what's called the current operating expense levy. It means that no matter where you live, no matter what school district you go to, everybody is what's called on the 20 mil operating expense. And we can go into what that, that exactly means, but that is the state bare bones minimum of what a school district gets. We have that just like every other school district in the state of Ohio has it. The other levy that we have currently on the books is an emergency levy. It was initially approved in May of 1982 by the community, 1982. I wasn't born yet. Um, it generates $712,000 annually, and it was last passed in November 2021, and is up for renewal next November. <clears throat> Emergency levy number two, it was passed in 1987. That is as old as I am. It generates 791 annually. It was last passed in November of 2019, and it is up for renewal this year. Um, and then emergency levy number three, again, it was initially approved in May 1995. Special note, that'll be 29 years this November, then was originally passed, or I'm sorry, we've already passed that. That is the last time that the to Local School Districts has gotten any new money, and it's been 29 years. It generates $1.3 million annually. It was last passed in 2019. It's up for renewal this year. And just a quick note, back in 2019, the previous Board of Education did take both emergency levy number two and number three and combined it into a single voting item. Um, many reasons for that, voter fatigue, um, it cost more money to put multiple ballots or multiple ballot issues on the ballot. So it was done as a cost saving measure as well as to, you know, to get the community and the public to quit having to come to the ballot so often. So those our emergency levies. We also have a permanent improvement levy. Um, it was first passed in November of 1990. Um, it generates $700,000 annually and it was last passed in November 2019. It's up for renewal this year. This levy does not go into our general fund, which we're going to talk mainly about the general fund tonight. Um, it goes into a separate fund that can only be used on permanent improvement to our facilities and capital. Um, it's, it's a separate bucket that can only be used for that. Uh, we have a bond issue. Um, a lot of you remember that we built new schools. Uh, the bonds were passed back in 2004. I'll have you remember that that was over, that it's 20 years ago this past May or this past November, actually 21 when they were passed in November. These aren't new schools anymore. You know, a lot of you, you know, you think of new schools and they do look nice. The district does a great job keeping, uh, keeping them up to date and taking care of them, but they are not new by any means anymore. Uh, the district paid $20 million of that cost. The state paid $80 million, and that those bonds are set to be paid off by the community by December of 2031. Once those goes, go away, they go away, and um, the community has a less tax burden. 
We also have a maintenance levy. Uh, it generates $200,000 annually. It was passed along with the bond issue. That also goes away in uh, 2026. It can only be spent on infrastructure for the new buildings. 20 mil floor. So we talked about this. This is the 1976 um, funding for all school districts. What that means is that every school district minimally gets to collect 20 mils. So that's 20 mils on um, the valuation of your home. Um, and that is minimum. Um, the Kumsa local school district just so happens to be on the 20 mil floor. Our emergency levies don't play into that. And so the Kumsa local schools is kind of in a situation to where the amount of income that they get from the 20 mil floor fluctuates based upon property values. County auditor comes in every three years, says your home's worth more, your home's worth less, direct impact on the district. Uh, we'll get into this a little bit more. There is another piece of legislation on the books called HB 920. It limits the amount of property taxes that can be collected if passed above the 20 mil floor on what can actually be collected. And it, what it's there for is it, it makes sure that as property values continue to go up, and if you've got a school district that's got um, a property value that's higher than the 20 mil floor or a rate that's higher than the 20 mil floor, it kind of caps that and reduces it so that there's not a huge escalation and taxpayers aren't just paying out the wazoo to the schools as their property value goes up. So levy types, we talked about the 20 mil floor already. Again, it changes based on property values. Every three years, it has to be updated. Um, with property taxes in general, I didn't put a, a bullet point on here, but like I said, if you were to pass a property tax for new operating expenses, it can only be, and Denise can correct me if I'm wrong at this at the end, it can only be on, if you say you pass a 14 mil levy, it can only be collected as what the property values were at that date and time. You can't collect any more than that. So as property values go up, you could still get the maximize the 20 mil floor, but you're fixed at that 14 mil. If property values go down, you're fixed at that 14 mil. It, it never goes up or goes down. Emergency levies, a little bit different. They fall outside of the 20 mil floor and they are a fixed dollar amount. So um, one put on the ballot, you go and you say, we are gonna put a $1 million emergency levy on the books. That is all that it can generate. No more, no less, and it operates outside the 20 mil floor. It is applied as a property tax. It does have an effect of millage in a sense because it's not really a property tax in terms of that. That's just how it's collected. It is a fixed dollar amount, but it's spread out proportionally amongst the community based upon home values. And then there's an income tax that school districts can also operate off of. I put earned in parentheses because an earned income tax allows for only new income to be taxed. It does not tax retirement accounts or anyone who's on a fixed income that who has retired, it's only new money. Um, point out, the district does not have an income tax. The 1.5% income tax that New Carlisle collects, as everyone in this room knows, that's in front of me and beside me, that's the city's income, not the school's. Um, and also, it does not impact the 20 mil floor. It operates outside of that. Let me take a quick drink real quick. Give me a second. So the next slide, and the reasons why we're talking about levies today, is I have a copy of a snippet from the five-year forecast. The state of Ohio requires all public schools to publish a five-year forecast. This was last published in May of 2024, and it sends out the amount of spending, revenue that's brought in um, over that five-year period. Um, our treasurer does a really good job at it. Um, it's a really good document to find. If you guys want to know more information or look at it in more detail, you can find it on the Tecumseh Local Schools website. So real quick revenue. Um, this is all of our revenue that we get to the general fund. That's, that's important to note because it's only a general fund driven item. Um, you can see in the very top, for those of you council members, I'm sorry, you'd have to turn around or you can look on your screen. The 1.010 line is our property tax. That includes the 20 mil floor levy that we have as well as all of our emergency levies. The next line down, the unrestricted grants and aid and the restricted grants and aid, that is all state funded. That comes directly from the state. 
So your income taxes, the um, gambling legislation that was passed some years ago, that is what that line item is. So you can see 2024, 2025, 2026, 2027, 2028, revenue is going down. There's some reasons behind that, but the, one of the main reasons is, is that we have re levies up for renewal next year and this year. We can't factor those into this because we can't assume that they're going to be passed. But that is the main reason why revenue is going down. Expenditures. Again, this is, uh, we are, the, when I say we, the schools, I'm acting as a private citizen here, the schools are a service-oriented business. You know, the primary thing that they do is educate and provide a service to the youth of the community and to the, you know, to educate them. And so the vast majority of the cost comes from salaries to teachers, staff, whatnot. Um, as with anything in life, as time goes on, things become more expensive. Inflation, um, you name it, things become more expensive. And so the five-year forecast shows, if you look at line item um, number three, 3.010, everything's getting a little bit more expensive. Employee benefits are getting a little bit more expensive. Supplies and materials are getting a little bit more expensive. To where you can see kind of down at the uh, total expenditures on 4.5, we are steadily increasing over the next five years on what we're spending, just because that's how things are. So this is the last snippet from the five-year forecast. This is our surplus to deficit spending. Um, you can see in 2025, we're really going to start deficit spending next year to where our end balance each year from now until 2028 is going to be slowly going down to where we're going to be in the negative close to $3 million by um, fiscal year 2028. So that's why I'm here. I'm here to talk about how do we solve this problem as a community. So history of cost containment measures, because that's important. You know, I don't want to schools and the levy community doesn't want to just come to the community and say we need more money we want to show that we've been fiscally responsible with the money that the that the community gives us you know to kind of point out the need for what we're talking about so one of the things uh, one of the biggest cost saving measures and this was done many moons ago but it was elimination of neighborhood schools that saved 1.4 million dollars to the community when that was done um, other things that have done, and we didn't assign dollar values to these, but um, you know, if it's something somebody would want, I'm sure we can get them. We've had a significant reduction in um, staff across the board that's classified, so teachers, certified, um, custodial staff, aides, um, bus drivers, that, that sort, and then administrative staff. Um, you know, our principals, vice principals, um, uh, just everybody that's working in the board office. So an assistant superintendent, uh, I believe Clark County is the only district in all of Clark County that does not have an assistant superintendent. Uh, Part-time central office accounting position, a full-time central office <coughs> secretary, a full-time secretary at the high school, actually two, full-time secretary at the middle school, a reduction to our ASA teacher and paraprofessionals, a reduction to our work study teacher, elimination of a special ed supervisor as well as elimination of five full-time teaching positions. There's also been a reduction of programs and exploratory classes, right, wrong, or indifferent. I hate to see, as well as I'm sure everybody else does, as well as everyone at the school, hates to see a reduction in classes being offered. Unfortunately, when times are tough and you have to make cuts, the, some of these things are the very first thing they have to go. We've reduced PE class offerings. The school's reduced family consumer science class offerings. Industrial tech, as much as that pains me. Art class offerings, a work study program, and we've had to eliminate the Aero School of Advancement program. Classes that have been eliminated to try and cut cost. History of cost containment measures included. Um, we've reworked contracts for our cop copiers with um, the utility companies to reduce costs, saved $126,000 a year. We've restructured um, HVAC contracts, uh, saved $200,000 a year. And then there has been direct uh, placement of debt, refinancing and whatnot to get that interest rate down to save more money for the community, close to $1.2 million saved. So going more, um, who remembers COVID? 
So a lot of people are probably not going to be familiar with the acronym ESSER. That's uh, a fancy way of saying federal COVID money given to public schools throughout the nation. So one thing that Tecumseh Local Schools did with that money is they used it to supplement salaries for the better part through COVID. Um, that actually kicked the can down the road of our deficit spending, the school's deficit spending, I should say, by about three years. So this was something that was going to rear its ugly head in 2021, 2022, but with the um, strategic use of COVID money, it kicked that can, can down further. Another thing that COVID money was used for, it provided every student in the district with a computer one-to-one -one ratio so that we could facilitate um, online learning. And it was also used for other cur curriculum material, and there were certain stipulations by the federal government on what it had to be spent on. What's really um, impressive to me on what was done is the building projects. <laughs> so the federal government allowed this money to be spent on large infrastructure projects. The district was able to defer money spent that would be come out of either the permanent improvement or the general fund to even you know keep that rainy day fund higher to elongate this process. Eight hundred thousand dollars on a boiler replacement. Like I said, the schools aren't new; they're twenty years old. Um, that's a cost that was saved to the community local taxpayer. Hot water heaters in all elementaries and Tecumseh High School, one hundred eleven thousand. New security system at the, at the athletic building, 18,000. Groundskeeping equipment, that's lawnmowers, tractors, things that keep the grounds looking nice uh, for the rest of the community. I mean, I don't know about you, but I'd hate to have a school that, you know, has got weeds growing all over the place and it's just a, a sore thumb to the community. Uh, $71,000, custodial, custodial equipment, things like uh, buffers and walk behind um, floor scrubbers. 71, I'm sorry, $95,000. Biggest item on that list is the middle school roof was replaced for the tune of half a million dollars, almost 600,000. Um, and then uh, altogether that deferred about $1.8 million out of the general fund that otherwise would have had to be spent. Maybe not necessarily right now, but down the road. So there has been a history of Fiscal responsibility, the district has made cuts. It's taken the money that was invested and given during COVID to elongate and stretch this thing out. I would like to say that, you know, to give you an example, and I won't name the school district, some people used it to install a jumbotron at their football stadium, not at Tecumseh. So here, um, this was actually sent out in the connecting link, our revenue to surplus deficit. You can see through uh, fiscal year 21, 22, 23, and 24, we had a surplus. Why was that? COVID money, as well as additional cuts that the district was able to make to maintain. COVID money dries up and goes away this year. So you can start to see over the next five years, deficit spending is going to start to increase per the five-year forecast. History of levies at Tecumseh Local Schools. The district tried to pass six income taxes all earned from 2004 to 2010. I think if you look at those numbers, they all failed pretty miserably. The closest one was 61%, which is a three to one or two to one vote. And so in 2011, the district decided to try something new and they went with the property tax. This is new money. This isn't any of the emergency levies that are currently on the books. Closest one was in 2013 and 2011 with a no vote for 51%. So now we get to this November and what we're doing and that what the district is going to do moving forward. We are in phase one of a two phase strategic plan. Phase one is rather simple and it shows up on the November ballot this November. We need to renew the PI levy. That's a simple renewal. Again, that was passed in 1990. We also need to renew one of our current emergency levies and then next year we would have to renew the other emergency levy. What the Board of Education did through many, I'll go more into that in detail, but that is that is the two, that is phase one. Renew the PI levy and then we're going to replace the two emergency levies that are on the books with what's called a substitute levy. And we'll go into what a substitute levy is here shortly. It does allow for new growth, but not on existing taxpayers. And then phase two, we will need to ask for new money 
What that is, whether it's a property tax, an income tax, an emergency levy, has not been determined, but it will be on the future ballots at some future date. So phase one, again, PI levy needs to be renewed. That's pretty cut and dry. Phase two, we're gonna take the $712,000 EM levy as well as the $2.1 million levy, combine them into one, and it's gonna be not just a simple lumping of them like it was for the $2.1 million, it's gonna be what's called a substitute. The reason for the substitute is, is that if you are living in a community that is having some amount of new construction growth, both residential and commercial, it allows for additional growth to be added on to that original fixed amount, but only on new homes and new businesses within the first term of the original passing of the substitute levy. This levy has got a 10-year term. It's not continuing. I think everybody knows here, me personally included, I like to be able to go and show my displeasure or pleasure to local governing bodies to say, I don't think you're doing a good enough job. I'm gonna vote no this time. But this allows the voters 10 years from now to come back and say, no, no more. Um, again, it does allow for growth and we can talk about what that growth actually is and how it necessarily impacts the housing developments in New Carlisle. Um, but again, it's only growth on new construction and all existing residents that live within Tecumseh Local School District, including all of your constituents in New Carlisle, pay the same, no new taxes. I'm gonna use the pizza analogy, if I could, to try and explain the substitute as I get a drink. Because I think pizza's a pretty commonly loved thing, and I think that it's easy to explain. Large pizza at Domino's cost 20 bucks. Sure. We're going for a special pizza here, Bill. Surface area is roughly 154 square inches. Humor me with the math, please. A medium 11-inch pizza costs $12. It has a surface area of 95 square inches. You're gonna invite 10 friends to your house and you guys are gonna order a pizza. You're all pretty hungry. I don't know about you, I could eat more than one pizza, slice of pizza, but again, humor me here. So you have one large pizza, 10 people come over, you divide it into 10 slices. The cost of the pizza is 20 bucks. Each friend pays $2. You each get a slice of 15.4 square inches, fills you up, you're content, you go on. But wait, you had two friends show up unannounced. It's a good thing because you haven't ordered the pizza yet. So what do you do? Do you take that same pizza you just bought and cut it up into 12, so everybody, 12 slices so everybody gets a little bit less? Or do you go ahead and order two medium pizzas, a little bit bigger, all around, just works out that the square inch per slice works out to be the same if you take those two medium pizzas and you divide them into six slices, and you only have to pay four dollars more, well you have two friends, so everybody gets the same amount of pizza that they were going to get originally for a little bit more money. Now it's true, you could have used that one pizza, cut it up into 12, everybody would have paid a little bit less, but you would have got less, and you would have gone home hungry. So that's the pizza analogy on what the substitute is doing. It is bringing in new people. It's adding them to the pot at the same rate that everybody else is paying currently. So the schools would see more revenue, but existing people would not pay any more, and the people coming in would pay the same that everyone else is. So phase two, plain and simple. I'll skip over it real quick after um, November when the PI levy passes and when the substitute levy passes, we will have to come for more money. Um, and we'll go into that why now. I wanna talk about uh, implications of the new housing developments and um, take this with a grain of salt. These are some assumptions taken here and I'll state the assumptions. Um, but some things we do know relatively well. Um, we do know that it's gonna probably take about 10 years, I think is what I've heard, for both housing developments to be built, okay? We do know that it's gonna be roughly 650 homes unless something drastically changes. So industry standard tells school districts that they should assume 0.6 students per home. That's 390 new students added to Tecumseh over the next 10 years. Now, that's not a big deal. You know, we have an empty elementary school. Surely we could take those 390 students. The substitute levy 
over 10 years with new homes, assuming each home is appraised by the county at $300,000 using the current effective millage on the emergency levies that we have, as well as that appraised value, as well as the 35% reduction factor on all property tax by the county, we could generate up to $400,000 annually after those homes are complete just by the substitute. In addition to that, when those 650 homes are bought or built, it could also generate between $1.1 and $1.3 million annually, depending upon the appraisal of the home. You know, you have 250 or 300,000. That's not purchase price, that's appraisal price that you would get from the 20 mil floor. Sounds like a good, good deal. New houses, new students, we're gonna get more money. Public school funding is not just local as we previously talked about, it's also state funded as well. The state of Ohio gives school districts more money per student. So the more students you have, the more money you get. The state of Ohio budget changes based upon whoever the governor, whoever the Congress is. So it's not a guaranteed thing year to year. So you can't always you know, assume you're gonna get that. But right now the state budget allots roughly $5,000 per student is what they give school districts that are enrolled at their, uh, their district. So 390 new students. Um, that's roughly $1.9 million is what the state would give for those added students over 10 years. Local share dollars, you're getting, uh, assuming it's a $300,000 appraised home, you're getting about 1.8. So total revenue from the new housing developments would be $3.8 million to the district. However, the cost to educate a student at Tecumseh Local Schools is $13,000 a pupil. We're only getting, um, when you add in uh, 390 students, the total income we're getting is 5.1 million, 5 million. So that's a deficit annually of $1.3 million by year 10, add it to the deficit spending that the district is already going to be experienced too. So yes, we're getting new money from the schools. Yes, the city's growing. It only adds to the burden. You can look behind you here. Um, it's broken out by 10 years, each because we can't collect all those taxes at once. And the growth is gonna be slow. So each year, we're assuming that 10% of the houses are getting built. We're getting 10% of that local share, 10% of the state share. By year 10, you have a 1.3 annual deficit from the new students even with the new income from the houses. Uh, graphical display, um, the orange is revenue, blue is expenditures, green is the deficit, only goes up with time. Back to the five-year forecast. So if you take some of those numbers I gave you uh, that are published and on the district website, here's a graph that shows the end of year balance through 2028, again, negative balance by 2028. You add in the new students. Again, we can only go out to 2028 because that's what the uh, state requires. Not much has changed there, but that's because we've only added maybe 20% of the total students by 2028. If you could extend that all the way out to 20, 2034, it'd be a whole lot worse. What about a TIF? I put this on here because I know, and thank you, to the previous council and this council for not holding the schools at harm for the last TIF on the R.D. Horton um, development. Um, by not holding us harmless or the school district harmless, you made sure that the school district got to receive their fair share and what's due to them. However, I do know that there's still TIF legislation coming on for the other housing development. If a TIF were to be passed and it holds the schools harmless or holds the schools and it's included and the additional revenue that the schools would get from that TIF goes into the TIF fund instead to the schools, you're looking at a $3.1 million deficit annually by year 10. So closing statements, it's a fact that Tecumseh Local Schools will start deficit spending in 2025. It's a fact that Tecumseh Local Schools has shown fiscal responsibility with taxpayer dollars in terms of cuts across the board as well as um, use of COVID money. Both levies on the November 2024 ballot are no new taxes on existing residents. That is a fact. November is phase one of a two-phase effort. 
Tecumseh local schools can acquire new money from new construction, but it's still not enough as shown by this presentation today. New homes will increase the deficit spending, even with a new income. A TIF would make a bad situation worse. Let's be frank. New home buyers want strong schools. I don't know about you. I've got two young children. If I were looking for a home, I would not move to a place that's got a school district that's on the verge of fiscal disaster. Please vote yes in November. Please share with your constituents and everyone that you know to vote yes in November. Again, this is no new money on anyone that's living here today. Um, it's critical that we get a yes vote um, in November, and then when phase two happens, that's critical as well. I'd be happy to open it up to any questions. And thank you for your time. I know that was long and drawn out, but it was important to be said. Matt, I will open it up for questions from council first, then we'll go to the audience and if they've got questions. Anyone on council have a question? Go ahead, Kathy. I guess I'm curious why you didn't ask for new money this year. Because the, you know. the reason for it is is that if we asked for new money this year, we had a renewal on the ballot. Mm -hmm. We were going to have to pass this year as well. Um, we didn't want to have three levies on the ballot. And especially since we have to add, we were going to have to have a renewal next year too. That would basically be, you know, three straight elections of levies. Mm -hmm. And so a strategic decision was made to take the two renewals, combine them together into one, get that passed, and then talk about new money. Because we, we, we do have a little bit of time, not much, that we could go to the ballot a couple of times, but not with the renewals. Did I answer your question? It does. I just, okay. you know, I know our citizens are not big on taxes at all. And yeah. I, I don't know. It's just like the more you ask, the more it sounds like you're, you know, I don't know how to say it correctly, but it sounds like you're being greedy even though I know they're renewals and they're not costing anything else. What I can tell you as a private citizen, but as the Board of Education, many meetings were spent coming to the decision that was made right. on the strategic sure. plan. Yeah. And there was a lot of thought taken into it, mm -hmm. specifically with that concern in mind. Right. But I, I appreciate it. I really do. Okay. Anyone else? If not, I'll, I'll go ahead, Mr. Pond. Is the uh, current student body, like when you go back into elementary school, incoming this fall, whatever, is it growing? Is it staying the same? Is it shrinking? I'd like to defer to Paula and Denise on that if I could. It is shrinking. <clears throat> Go ahead, Bill. Yeah. This is Mr. Bond done? I'm done, yes. Uh, this question and her answer brought me to a question. Why, and my just direct her, sir? Uh, are you okay with that, <laughs> Mrs. Kirk? Okay. Why, why does the school or the board superintendent think this is uh, student membership or enrollment is shrinking. Is people moving out, they're homeschooling, or they are mad at the district, or something happened in the district? I mean, there's a lot of variables to, to that. Are, and there are a lot of variables. I know that we've had an increase of students who have exited to go to STEM schools that are popping up. They're available to students. Um, the science and math schools. We've had students who are going homeschooled. There's a lot of, um, heard, there's a lot of charter schools and different schools that are popping up and funding from the state level is going to those schools instead of our schools and um, people are choosing to go to those charter schools, uh, not just here at Tecumseh, but at many schools throughout the state of Ohio um, are seeing a decline in their population because parents are opting to go from public to charter schools. Is, is there a reason why that you know of? Is it, I'm not at the risk of making everybody mad in this room. Uh, do they think they're getting a better education at the charter or STEM schools than they are in public schools? Is that their I thinking? I'm sure as a parent to guess that that's the reason they would pull their child and take them to a STEM or a charter school. And if they're not getting the education that they're getting at the charter school, 
an interesting fact, we have a high number of those students who come back to us okay. after attending those schools, and then another way that goes to those schools, nothing against the charter schools, I don't think that disrespectfully, mm -hmm. but we have oftentimes a lot of them who will try it and come back. Okay. And, and the state money follows the student, correct? The state money does follow the student. Okay. All, right. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. You know. Anyone else? All right, we'll open it up to the floor. If anybody from the floor has got a question. If not, Matt, I thank you and the group for the presentation. I guess we'll all do everything else we can in order to see this is taken care of in the November. I appreciate it. And thank you for your time. I know it was long-winded, but it was important to be said. So thank you. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Mr. Keener. He's not here. He's not here. He's not here. No. He's going to be here at the next meeting. Please. He'll be here at our next council meeting. Okay. On the 19th. Uh, he's not here. I guess we go to, uh, I believe, the vice mayor has a letter from my resident that I'd like for her to read. Um, dear mayor and council, I have noticed your display of the Godsden snake flag on North Main Street. I don't appreciate its prevalence equals the United States flags nearby. Your yellow flag has most recently been displayed as a symbol of insurrection against the U.S. government while conducting legal transfer of presidential authority. I understand you want to show your support for all minorities, racial, ethnic, or whatever. I will expect you to fly my gay pride flag next year. And the Godson snake flag is the one that says, do not tread on me. And that was designed in, in 1775 to show unity of the 13 colonies. And I, I don't know what he's referring to as a symbol of insurrection against the U.S. government, but I thought that I would let council know he would like to have a response, so what I was thinking is maybe we could do a proclamation and have a day or a week or a month or whatever of diversity. Whether, you know, I don't know what flags we can fly or what, but if we can make, maybe and make the rest a council got any comment? Uh, or just, uh, Mr. Mayor, Go ahead. or just Keep it as freedom of speech and be done with it. That's my opinion. Did you copy that? Yeah. Okay. All right. Enough on that issue. I also received a letter from uh, Mr. Don Hall, not the one living in town, his parents, in regards to the. Uh, property that's being torn down for the Taco Bell. And he explained that he thought that possibly something could have been done in order to save that building. Possibly some type of an economic development group that would have bought that. I think at this point there's not too much that we can do as a council due to the fact that that was for sale for a lengthy period of time and it was between the seller and the buyer. Privately owned. So my thing is I'll send him a note back explaining that 
And unless somebody else has a better way of doing this, go ahead, Bill. The, the, uh, that property was privately owned. It was out of the authority jurisdiction of the city. Uh, it's no different than somebody selling their home to somebody who wants to tear it down and make a park. Uh, you know, or, or if somebody wants to sell their business and then tear it down and, and put another business in, a different type of business or a restaurant or something. So the, uh, I, I guess I don't understand the letter uh, complaining to us when we had no, no jurisdiction or authority over that, that building. And I, and I understand a lot of people in town uh, that I had heard from or talked to wanted the building to be saved because it was old and I guess it's, it was, I don't know how long, how long it had been there or the value it had. But again, the bank owned it, the bank sold it because they didn't want it. It was my understanding that the building was in poor structural shape and it would have taken a considerable amount of money to have brought it up to code. So I think I will answer the gentleman that uh, primarily that was between the buyer and the seller and hopefully we can come out of that. With that, we'll have the city manager's report. Give me a second to get caught up here, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you, members of uh, <coughs> Mayor Cook, members of council, members of the public, and of course, administration. <coughs> City manager report that dated August 5th. Since this is the first meeting of the month, that is kind of light, but we'll get through it here. Um, so first, we have the planning and zoning uh, and mayor's court report that was attached to the packet and some stats for the crowd and camera. For the period July 20, I mean, July 7th through July 26th, we had 71 total violations. 40 total properties violated. That averaged out to about 1.78 violations per property. 34 closed violations, two violations submitted to mayor's court, and two uh, property extensions granted. And then we also follow that along with our mayor's court report. So then we'd like to take a look at that. That is also online. Uh, under informational items, give me a second here. First bullet point is 2025, nine, uh, 2025 to 2029 capital improvement plan. That was submitted to council on uh, July 26 via email. Please take a look at that. In years past, what we've done is entered the CIP, did some work sessions on it, and did pass the resolution, and then let that sat for a couple months. Then we went to our budget stuff, and then we ended up having to slash that CIP because the budget didn't account for all the projects we wanted to do or purchases. Um, so talking to Jake, looking at our codes, um, nothing in our code says that we have to have it approved by council three months before submission of the budget. It just simply has to be submitted. So that's what we did. We submitted it. So let's take our time with it. And what I'd like to do at the next meeting in August, when Colleen is here, our finance director, set a, a, some a budget work session dates, maybe in October, or November, to start looking at the capital improvement plan as well as our 2025 operating budget. But I think with this new process of just giving the council a study doing in a resolution, and we'll still pass that by resolution, it's just going to be the resolution that we pass right before we do the ordinance. So take it, digest it for a little bit. We'll be visiting that back up probably here late September, early October. But I at least wanted to note and give you uh, the update of why there's no resolution to approve it at this point in time. Any questions for that particular matter before I go on? Because it may have been just a little confusing because it's new this year. Anyone have any questions? No? Okay. And under hazard mitigation plan update, uh, we will be meeting with Vancrest on 8-8 eight, eight of this week. We're discuss their generator and where they're having some, uh, maybe some uh, not covered by the generator, get them covered. Um, we also have a local disaster recovery plan. I do want to uh, discuss that with council at our 9-9 work session, and that would be the second meeting of that, I mean, second Monday of that <coughs> month. And then to the resolution to accept that, should it be okay with council, would be at the September 16th meeting. And again, I've met with Fire Chief. We've had a few good meetings on that, uh, just on the uh, process of drafting it. Water office shadowing by Vice Mayor Eggleston and Councilwoman Wright. <clears throat> we have set a meeting for 820, and they're going to meet with myself, Colleen Harris, and Sarah Wooden to go over some additional things that they had saw, and then to some changes that we want to make. Any of those changes we make to code will, of course, come back to council in the form of an ordinance. But I think we're going to make some changes that will benefit not only the city, but also, more importantly, benefit our citizens. Uh, 
policy and other items council still working on that citizen of the year um, we still have that that award we need to give out we still need to really discuss about what level you guys want to do citizen of the year non-citizen of the year maybe suggesting we can also discuss that at the nine nine work session as well and that'd be it for council to decide um, upcoming legislation we do have the second round of, of, of uh, the reserves at honey creek legislation i uh, will be fast forwarding that i did get some additional information that we've, we've been waiting on so I'm going to forward that to our attorney uh, out of Columbus, who's our, our TIF attorney, and then he'll work with Jake on getting the required documentation and legislation to council. And also, too, we are doing the first round of the Monroe Meadows TIF here shortly as well. I don't have a given council meeting date on that yet, but I can say it is will probably with, be within the next uh, one to three meetings. Uh, so that's all I have for my city manager report. I'd be happy to, any, to entertain any questions. Go ahead, Mr. Bond. Um, Mr. Bridge. The two TIF legislations there, mm -hmm. are those what Mr. Mills was talking about as far as it doesn't, those are the type that aren't going to penalize the school? So that'd be it for you guys to decide. So the first one we drafted did was a non-school TIF. I planned on doing that the second time around. The previous council had showed interest in doing that, both of our developments non-school TIF. I assumed that would be the same with this one. Um, so we were going to draft it as a non-school TIF. So it'd be the same as same what we yeah, would not impact that. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Great. Thank you. Yep. Is that how council wants to move forward with that legislation? Now that we got you all here. I think that's the way it should be. We yep. should not impact the schools with the trail. Okay. I figured. I mean, I'm just one council member, but yeah. do, you, do you want a motion to that effect? I think I got it. I think I'm good. Okay. Uh, Kathy, what else does the TIF cover, or should we be aware of what it covers? Or well, all the TIF is, is is using a portion of the property tax to help pay for improvements. So basically, if you wanted to ta take some of the school TIF money, school property tax, you'd have to approve that at, at at your level. So since you're not doing that at the level, then they'll get the same amount of property tax they would get normally. So, but that TIF is just it's tax increment financing, and what it does is let's just say this is a vacant parcel of land. Right. It's valued at five dollars now because there's nothing on it. So we get five dollars a year. Well, county gets five dollars a year property tax revenue. Now we have a house on it. Now it's worth a hundred dollars. So what that means is they'll still the school will still get the original amount of what it is, but the additional the increased amount will help pay for the infrastructure. Let's say there's a road that had to go in here. Mm -hmm. So part of that increase of that one five dollar to one hundred dollars would help pay for that road to come in. So it's just there to help pay for infrastructure projects. Our and it's lights? based off the increased value, property value, not the existing. Are street lights can, in that mm -mm. thing too? Mm -mm. No. That's that's a street lobby assessment. That's a different okay. thing, which we'll have legislation entered that we'll, you'll be voting on for next meeting. Yeah, I was wondering about that. Yep. Hi, Bill. Uh, Mr. McBridge, I think I know the answer to this question. Sure. But on the uh, TIF legislation that does not impact the school, the part that goes for the infrastructure which is street sewers water lines stuff like that correct mm -hmm. that goes back to the developer because right. they pay for that up front and that is how they get their money back it, and it does not uh none of that money comes to the city no it's kind of, we receive it we and get then it we, and we, and pass we okay yep. okay mm -hmm. uh but we don't get to keep any of that money, even though we get it. We, if we get a hundred thousand dollars, we write him a hundred thousand dollar check yeah. as an example. Yeah, they'll call us. They'll, they'll call us every it's, it's every three months, six months, however they want to call, and then yeah. they'll call say, all right, this is what we spent, and then they'll show us documentation on that, and then we'll send them all. We'll send them a dollar amount to them. Right. Okay. We're just the middleman on the tax. The county still receives it all to us. And then the county will actually phase it out because each one of these developments is phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four. Each TIF starts at each new phase. So the phase two TIF won't start until the first house on phase two is actually broken ground. So the county will keep track of what phased out and then we receive it, just like I said, pass it on once they call for that. Okay. Yep. And we and forego our property tax. Right. The school keeps theirs. Right. That's how this works. The, uh, right. And, and the reason I'm even asking the question is for. The members up here that don't know, mm -hmm. especially Mr. Sure. Wright, uh, <laughs> since she is new and had the question on the TIF, I, I thought it needed more explanation for, for right. her and maybe some others to sure. understand that. So that, that's all I've got. Sure. Thank you. Well. <clears throat> all right, if you're done with that, um, 
Do we? Have, I don't assume we don't have any committee reports mm -hmm. that I'm aware of. If not, we'll go to comments from members of the public. Your comments are limited to five minutes or less, and please state your name when you come up to the podium. Go ahead, Dylan. Janelle. Janelle Zimmerman, 219 Prentice Drive. Um, I just had a question. You said when they spend that money for whatever on that TIF, then you give them that amount of money. Oops, that amount of money, I think you said. Um, if they don't spend that amount of money, do we keep that money? No. Um. They get it for something else, or what? How does that work? I would be under the assumption that when they are making a request some are they to show some kind of a billing method we have a schedule they give us they would schedule a billing method so that i think in the how do i say this i think when when that project is done they're going to have a massive bill and we're going to show x amount of payments over a period of time that would be something that would probably exhaust that TIF fee. Am I thinking right? No, they'll get 100% back. Of it. Usually, they won't give. They won't receipt 100% back. They'll still take a little bit of loss. So there won't be any kind of. They spent 20 bucks and we have 30 dollars in the fund. They usually take a loss on it. Still, it just helps cushion their loss per se. So right now, the first phase of I think it's the offer um, is around 2.2 million dollars for the public infrastructure. So we know what that is. So we know based off property tax, they're going to get. They're going to get well under the 2.2 million dollars. So they still take that law. So I've never seen a tip where the city's had a surplus at the end. Okay. Yeah. I just wondered about that. It's a good question. Um, Did that answer your question? <coughs> yes, no. it did. It did. And I thought the gentleman who um, was telling about the schools and the budget and everything that was very enlightening and I thought he did a really good job you did. even I could understand that you know it made it really I, I'm glad I got he here did, he did a that. very good job and I think that possibly um, some of us may have been enlightened as to what they were trying to do with this levy yeah I, I thought I thought that was a good presentation so I want to say I'm not contagious <laughs> <laughs> the doctor said that she thinks it's coming from allergies but I have this horrible horrible cough and I don't want to be coughing on somebody if I start hacking so I can't I thought I had another question but I can't remember what it was so well you got Thank a chicken you. in your hand is anything about that huh? well yeah I brought Henrietta <laughs> I want to encourage everyone <laughs> to vote topic. to vote for the chicken <laughs> for the chickens to be in town and vote I encourage everyone to vote no matter how you feel about it really yeah. but but I support the chicken I don't think we want to address that tonight okay <laughs> just thought it was funny she had a chicken with her <laughs> anyone else that's awesome oh, go ahead Ken. I kind of have a question back on the tip again too at what point will it be paid off and will we receive the houses taxes is that 10 years is that 20 years are we looking yeah, I, at I can't tell you that I well a guess yeah. it? I'm not going to put it. Can't even guess. Now. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. All righty. <laughs> okay. Since there are no other uh, questions from the public or comments, I guess Mrs. Berner will go to the resolution and ordinance. Okay. We have a lengthy list this evening. Resolution 2024-08, Introduction, Public Hearing, and Action Tonight. A resolution declaring the necessity of improving the streets of the city of New Carlisle, Ohio, by lighting them. Do I have a motion and a second? No move. Second. Got two on the floor. Uh, explanation yep. of this resolution. This is a yearly resolu resolution we do. Uh, it is for street lighting. Uh, this is going to be followed next week by Ordinance 2024-40 and 41. Uh, these will determine to proceed with the street lighting and levy assessments to do so. Any questions? Go ahead, Kathy. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I just want to 
re say it the way I understand it. So, in other words, every year we okay for them to take taxes from us to pay for our street lights. Is that correct? Is that what we're saying? It's not a tax, it's an assessment. An so assessment. Based, yeah, so it's based off yeah. your frontage. Right. So you have X amount of frontage and they take that, I think we charge like 95 cents or something like that per foot of frontage and then you pay that. And then right. there you go. Okay. <coughs> well, I mean, uh, Mr. Mayor, um, thank you. Uh, is this this isn't new lighting project or no this no, is just the existing yep, what we have yep, yep okay Thank this you. is the housekeeping major mm -hmm. yeah. yep yeah. got it bill uh, this will also allow the residents to come to the city building and write a check for their assessment so it doesn't go on their property taxes if they so choose yeah, we're still a few weeks away from that, but same okay. process that we do every year now. We'll put a legal ad out, and then um, if you don't come and pay it at the city building, it does go onto the auditor website, and I do believe there's a 10% additional penalty. Right. 98% of the people just let it go onto the auditor office. We have very few that come in and pay, but we do that every year. We have the list uh, ready to go for you. Okay. Hey, thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> there being no other questions, let's All right. Mayor Cook. Yes. Councilman Bond? Yes. Councilman Shammy? Yes. Councilwoman Wright? Yes. Councilman Lindsay? Yes. Vice Mayor Eggleston? Yes. That passes 6 to 0. We have Ordinance 2024-34. Introduced on July 15th, public hearing in action tonight. An ordinance amending Section 10.6. 1060.99 of the codified ordinances of the city of New Carlisle regarding garbage and rubbish collection and disposal. <coughs> Do I hear a motion? Go ahead. Second. 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 Okay. Who's the first? Shammy. Who's yeah, the Mr. Bond. Bond on the second. Yep. Uh, explanation of this ordinance. Uh, this will update our current code. Um, and it will specifically state who enforces this code section. Um, and then two, it also increases that fee from $100 to $150 should you get uh, entered into the court system, mayor's court. Are and there any other questions? Go ahead, Ken. Yeah, um, the separate offense for the $150 a day, I just, I don't understand that. And I know you said at the last meeting that it's not liable for that amount of money to go through. It's just that if somebody doesn't have the money, the, the worst thing we can do is charge them an additional $150 a day for however long it takes them to find the money. So I, I just have an issue with that daily price. You know, if it was a monthly price or something, that'd be okay, but I just don't see the daily myself. I'm gonna let our law director speak on that. All right. So they they get cited once, and it would be for the, like, the maximum $150, mm -hmm. and that's, the one day um it, it's very uncommon they're not going to be cited again the next day and cited again the next day and so on and so forth so that's just saying like say they get cited once they pay the fine and then they don't correct it in the future they can get cited again and so on and so forth but when would the future be and it's just kind of vague it doesn't say it says each day i mm -hmm. i just not sure it's worded the way that makes good sense to regular people. A separate offense shall be deemed committed each day during on or on which a violation or noncompliance occurs or continues. That's similar to any type of building code violation, zoning violation. Um, it just mirrors that same type of language. I just don't like the way it's written, that's all. Okay. <clears throat> Any other comments? Go ahead. Who? <clears throat> hmm? You see, who is the person involved or people involved to uh, penalize the citizens? So the code enforcement officer. That's what it says. There will be any law enforcement officer planning director, his or her designee, <coughs> or the code enforcement <coughs> officer, his or her designee. So, the so these are the three people who refuse to have your rumpy service. The sheriff's department. Any law enforcement, basically our contracted deputies. Yeah. 
So <clears throat> basically, this centers around you guys have a contract out that blatantly says one and two family households have to have the Rumpke contract. So this enforces that. That's, that's what this is. Now, as far as the penalty per day, that's for you guys to go on through. But is, it does mirror other aspects of our code and our code in other cities as well. So, um, but however you guys determine to move that, that's on you guys. But this, this particular code section does deal with the people who um, don't have your trash service. And other aspects of it too, but basically your contract and trash service. And should you guys amend it, then we will have to uh, enter it next week at the next meeting and it has to start the process over again. Do we know how many of those people that were on that list? We haven't picked it back up since I've been back from vacation, so we'll be hitting that this week, but it was around 70. Originally? No, originally it was a lot more than that. I think it was about 140. I think there was 200 at one point. Well, it was 140, but we sent out additional letters to property owners mm -hmm. in addition to a resident. So a rental could have got, you know, two letters, one to the occupant and then another letter to the actual property owner. So do we have any idea of how many are still hanging Ar out? Around 70. Around 70. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. Go ahead, Bill. The, uh, back on the enforcement part of it, I don't think we should have our police officers enforcing stuff like that. We have a code enforcement officer we have the planning director or their designees. I think that is, if we're gonna have our deputies enforcing all of these codes, why do we have enforcement code, code enforcement officers for? Our contracted deputies are responsible to enforce every one of our codes. I understand so that. So that's why, so it's just another level of enforcement. There may be time we don't have a code enforcement officer on staff. Um, or sometimes it's better suited that your law enforcement officer does violate that person because that particular address could have a violent history. I'm not sending staff up there to deal with a, a citizen that's irate over, you know, you know, a trash bill. So it's very common for your law enforcement people to enforce, especially given, given it's under the, uh, um, I'm sorry, it's under the 1060s. I, I misspoke on that, but very common. If it, 660s deals with our, our police officers. That's why, uh, for a second there, our next one coming up is under 660. How many of the 70 people has trash laying around their house that they're not disposing of? And also, how many of those has other means to get rid of their trash? I don't know, and both of those are not, I can't answer those questions because the governing ordinance that this council has passed doesn't say they can not have trash service if they can get rid of it by other means. It doesn't say as long as there's trash isn't building around a the house, they're good to go. It blatantly says you are required to have the service. And it's not just for the current 70 people. This is going to be permanent moving on. So uh, next year we'll have to use it year after year after. Um, we don't have any kind of trash issue. I think people generally take care of their houses, but it's just the fact that we need an enforcement option in here given the, you know, the contract that we have with Rumpke that's already been passed by council. So we need to have some enforcement level for the people who are not complying with the previous matters voted on by council. Well, I, I agree with Councilman, Councilwoman uh, Wright on the 150 fine. I think that's steep, but that's my opinion. Uh, that's all I have, sir, thank you. Go ahead, Mr. <coughs> so would you guys want to amend that part? I'd like to see that last line amended. It seems to me the 150 to me doesn't seem that unreasonable because they're being defiant at this point, I, I believe is what you're saying, that they don't want the service. But I understand some of the reasons. Some people don't have much trash and they can share with their next door neighbor and well, do that and either. I understand some of that so I don't want to be a total butt about it but I mean we need to fix that ordinance the original then is is my opinion 
in, your, in the current contract, you're not allowed to share. I, I assume that. Yeah. That's why I already hadn't brought it up because I thought about doing that. But I know when contract time comes again, we have to fix. I I feel like we have to fix that. Go ahead, uh, Mr. Jeffries. Is there a way to reword that to where it is a little clearer? Oh. I would have to think about it. You don't want to run into the issue where, you know, um, not having the trash service is a penalty by itself. You get you go to court, you pay the $150 fine, and then you don't fix it, and then you get charged again, and then you try, then that person could argue double jeopardy, basically. I've already been uh, charged with this offense and convicted and, you know, paid the penalty. So that's why that language is in there to make it clear that <clears throat> if it's an ongoing issue, you can be charged again. Gotcha. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. That's why it's there. <coughs> <coughs> if there's no one else, there's a burn. Okay. The second was Bond, correct? Yeah. Councilman Chammy. No. Councilwoman Wright? No. Did you say no? I'm sorry. No. Okay. Councilman Lindsay? No. Vice Mayor Eggleston? Yes. Mayor Cook? Yes. Councilman Bond? No. All right. That one fails. Two to four. So right now, since that ordinance fails, we have no authority to uh, hold anyone accountable for not having the Rumpke trash service. You can bring it back to us next week, maybe? Uh, that'd be on for you guys, unless you guys make a motion for me to do that. But I would recommend the people maybe who voted no draft the new legislation and work with Jake on that. That's what it says and the way we should do stuff. So I can set up a meeting with Jake. He's available on Thursdays I'll and you four can come that. together. And uh, that way you guys know what it says and, mm -hmm. and just take it from there. All right, that works for me. I'll do it. Let me ask a dumb question since law director is here. All right, Jake. We put out a contract for X amount of homes. Mm -hmm. And if we've got, let's say 2,000 homes and 70 of that are not having trash service, are we not in violation of that contract? Uh, I'm curious to see. I don't know the answer to that. I'm not going to speculate. That's why I asked the law director. Well, we're, it should be directed to me. We're supposed to assist with the enforcement of their contract. Yes. This is why we sent out all the letters. This is why we did the push we're supposed to do based off the contract that was already passed by the governing body. So, um, yeah, just bring it back. I mean, I understand, you know, like in the per day fee, it's fine, but that's how we do it. You guys don't like it, you don't pass it. You meet with our law director, you draft something you like, and you bring it back to your governing body. Our administrative concern is just having some enforcement for people who are right. who and you we don't need have that. the tracks. Yes. Yeah, but how you guys move forward, that's all, that's all you guys, for sure. Do you guys have, what's your schedule looking like for this Thursday? You guys want to meet with Mr. Jeffries this Thursday or the Thursday after that? I can do it this Thursday. I don't know who else wants to do it. I got I got to work, so yeah. 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 I'm tied up on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So. You want? Would you like to? I'll I'll yeah. be happy to do it alone, and yeah. I can share with these two. Sure. With, sure. Um, what time is best for you, Mrs. Wright? Not in the morning. What? Not in the morning. <laughs> I respect that. <laughs> um, Anytime after 11. <laughs> do, you, do, you mind if, do you mind if you guys just communicate, yeah. set up your time? Sure. I'll send you your okay. gotcha. You got it. <coughs> Perfect. So that's what I'm going for. If we're done with that, uh, go ahead, Ms. Byrne. Okay. Ordinance 2024-35, an ordinance providing for the submissions to the electors of the City of New Carlisle proposed amendments to the preamble and Articles 2 and 3 of the City Charter. So moved. Second. There was Shammy and then. Right. Um, explanation of this, this is the, the charter review you guys wanted to do and put on the ballot. And 
Any comments? Councilman Lindsay? Yes. Vice Mayor Eggleston? No. Mayor Cook? Yes. Councilman Bond? Yes. Councilman Shammy? Yes. Councilwoman Wright? Yes. That passes five to one. Ordinance 2024-36, an ordinance providing for the submission to the electors of the City of New Carlisle proposed amendments to Article 4 of the City Charter. Second. Second. Uh, explanation of this ordinance, this is the uh, Article 4 of the Charter Amendments Council wanted to put in front of the voters. Any comment? If not, Mrs. Burr. Councilman Chammy? Yes. Councilwoman Wright? Yes. Councilman Lindsay? Yes. Vice Mayor Eggleston? Yes. Mayor Cook? Yes. Councilman Bond? Yes. That passes 6 0. Ordinance 2024 37. Introduced on July 15th. Public hearing in action tonight. An ordinance amending section 660. Point thirteen of the codified ordinances of the city of New Carlisle regarding weeds and grasses. Sorry. Is that you? Yep. Second. Uh, explanation of this ordinance. <clears throat> this ordinance will update the current code and allow for grass and weeds to be eight inches or less in height. And also update this section to reflect abatement uh, charges as detailed in section 1460.15 of the city's existing code. Any comments? Vice Mayor Eggleston? No. Mayor Cook? No. Councilman Bond? Yes. Councilman Shammy? Yes. Councilwoman Wright? Yes. Councilman Lindsay? Yes. That passes four to two. Thirty-eight, correct? Okay. Ordinance twenty twenty-four thirty-eight, introduction, public hearing, and action tonight. An ordinance authorizing the acceptance of the terms of the March twenty-second, twenty twenty-four Kroger multi-state settlement agreement and declaring an emergency. Do I have a motion? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. Oh, it's okay. I didn't hear a second, though. I'll second. Jamie Wright. An explanation of this ordinance. So this is, uh, we got wind of the Kroger settlement, so we entered the other lawsuit. Oh, we did enter it late. We still have not received any funds for that. Um, there's a second chance to get in with the Kroger settlement. I do not know how much we're expected to get should council want to enter this. And again, if you should choose to enter this, we will then enter into an MOU with the county to pass those funds through. Uh, these funds are heavy stipulated, and we just do not have the means to handle that in-house. The funds do have to be used towards opioid uh, reduction and stuff like that. So the county does have some cool projects they're working on. Again, we would just funnel the money to the county. Any comment? Go ahead, Bill. Uh, I forget, when did we find out about this? Because it says here that the... the uh, terms are on March 22nd or 24th, and we found out about it when? Uh, last meeting. So it was in my spam email inbox. I didn't see it till late. Oh. Which triggered the emergency ordinance. Mm -hmm. Go ahead again. Yeah, to my understanding then, if, if we don't say we want this money, then Drigfield will not get our money, right, to use to? I think it just rolls back into the allocation. To the right. So it would be divided between 10 counties instead of, well, no, that wouldn't work. It's each region, city. It, the state's region. divided into regions. Uh, we're region four, we're with Butler County, et cetera, stuff like that. So right. each region uh, handles their own money with projects and all that stuff. And right. then you can do sub projects, but the state allocates how much we get, but we haven't had that sent to us yet. 
I'm assuming that comes after the fact. So we got that dollar amount well after everyone had entered the first round of legislation. Sure. Mm -hmm. so. Go ahead, Mom. Are you done? Well, I, I was just going to say, you know, even if we're not going to, you know, enjoy the money, so to speak, I would like to see the money go to Springfield and Clark County to probably improve their services. In my opinion, that seems to be logical. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Bridges, is there, in your opinion, a reason why we wouldn't do this? Not really. I mean, honestly, if we're just going to pass it through, that's fine. If, if we were to keep it in house, I'd have some concerns just because of the stipulations that deal with it. We do lose control over that money and how they how they use it at the county level. Um, I've been part of their meeting, so that's historically how it goes when we're on the side of the county. But it is there for a purpose. It is there to help alleviate a pandemic, and people would need it. Um, I, I I would I would pass it. And I sincerely apologize for making an emergency ordinance. Um, that was my fault. But given the nature of what it was, and since it was just a pass through fund, I thought it'd be appropriate just to do it as an emergency. Um, so my recommendation would to would would be to. I struggled with it for maybe a, a week or two, uh, but when I sat down and thought about it, it's we're just passing it through. We're going to help other people help people. Mr. Mayor, go ahead. Uh, for a couple of the council members, uh, and Mr. Bridge, correct me if I'm wrong, we have had ordinances before uh, previous councils that we pass through money back to the county because it it is so time consuming and expensive for us as a city to, to uh, manage that, that we've had ordinances like this before and we've sent it back to the county and let the county manage it because obviously they're a bigger organization than we are. So for, for us to do this, to pass this and send our portion back to the county for the county to distribute in whatever programs relating to this one, which is opioid, opioid uh, I, I think that's personally, I think that's per perfectly acceptable. And I think as, as, as a council member to, to my council, that we should pass this and send the money back to the county. Thank Any you. further comment? Mrs. Byrne. Councilman Lindsay. Yes. Vice Mayor Eggleston. Yes. Mayor Cook. Yes. Councilman Bond. Yes. Councilman Shammy. Yes. Councilwoman Ray. Yes. That's a six a zero. The next ones are read only we have ordinance 2024-39 introduction tonight public hearing and action on august 19th an ordinance authorizing the city manager or the director of public service assistant city manager to enter into a contract for the purchase of de-icing rock salt ordinance 2024-40 introduction tonight public hearing and action on august 19th an ordinance determining to proceed with the improvement of certain public streets within the corporate limits of the city of New Carlisle, Ohio by lighting them. Ordinance 2024-41, introduction tonight, public hearing and action on August 19th. An ordinance levying assessments for the improvement of certain public streets within the corporate limits of the city of New Carlisle, Ohio by lighting them. Ordinance 2024 Dash 42, introduction tonight, public hearing and action on August 19th. An ordinance certifying to the Clark County Auditor and authorizing placement on the tax duplicate certain delinquent utility accounts for collection with real estate taxes. Ordinance 2024-43, introduction tonight, public hearing and action on August 19th. An ordinance certifying to the Clark County Auditor and authorizing placement on the tax duplicate certain uncollected weed and or grass cutting fees for collection with real estate taxes. Ordinance 2024-44, introduction tonight, public hearing and action on August 19th. An ordinance establishing a moratorium on adult use cannabis operators within the city of New Carlisle, Ohio. Ordinance 2024-45, introduction tonight, public hearing and action on August 19th. An ordinance supplementing certain appropriations contained in New Carlisle City Ordinance 2023-61. Done. <laughs> <coughs> Any 
Even really good. She has got two breaths doing all that. I don't think it breathed. I know. The one word threw me off, though. I was like, oh, I said that right, didn't I? Yeah. Yeah. Are you going to do the additional? Oh, city? yeah, sure. Why not? Additional city business, movie night, cars, August 24th, 2024, at dusk in Smith Park. And the next one says open for discussion on city related business. Question That uh, notice for the opening on council will appear Thursday? It, yes, it can. It's been approved. I, it's drafted and I had Mr. Brady. It will be it. Thursday. Hopefully. Yeah, I'll probably put it in tomorrow morning, so maybe Friday. Well, okay, I'm trying to. Yes, I, it day. should fall in the correct parameters so that you guys can do it the next regular council meeting. But it, it has to be not sooner than 10 days. You have to wait at least 10 days. 10 days after yeah. that. It's not right. before 10 days, it's after 10 days. Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. When does my begin? So you once once you know once you announce the vacancy, you can't appoint anyone until ten days after. Right. Yeah. Right. Ten days from the publication date. Publication. Publication date. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Got. It. That's why I want to clear up. So publication yeah. date. Okay. I need to write that down. So it should be all right. right? That should be good. Does anyone else go ahead, Kaz? Curious. Are that being we're going to interview people at our next council meeting too? On the nineteenth. I mean, you got that what I had point. discussed doing was once we get the applications in, mm -hmm. I don't know whether you remember when we had everybody up for the open seats. Yeah, I do. What I had thought about doing was having council here, the applicants over there, letting council question them with either a moderator or someone here. Mm -hmm. That way we would do it all at once. Are we expecting that many applicants? I don't know. Mm -hmm. If we only have one, then we have one. Uh, I, I believe that there will be probably at least two that I'm aware of. Okay. Uh, maybe all right, which one of you is first? The, uh, you said we'd interview all of them at one time. We've never done that in the past. We've always done individual interviews. Uh, myself, I would prefer to do individual interviews instead of having all of them at one time. My first thought on that was the fact of doing it in a concise environment and possibly holding it down in time. If we, let's say we do five, that way we've got a half hour a piece, 15 minutes a piece, whichever you choose. But I can go either way, it makes no difference to me. Personally, I think inter, in, interview, my mouth and my tongue together, individual interviews I think would be better because we have set a precedent for that, and I think that's that's what we I think that's what we should do. Why don't we wait until we see how many applicants we get and could, then adjust from there? You might get two or three. I, well, it could be. You know, I, I don't. You may not get any. Go ahead, Peg. I think that um, since this is a seat on council and they are to be representing the citizens, that. If we have any questions from people from the audience, from the city and citizens who have come to the meeting, they should be able to answer questions from them also. Go ahead, and Bill. I don't believe we've ever done that either in the past when we filled council seats. We have not done that with uh, replacements on council, we've done it with. Uh, people running for office. New people that we have to vote on. In right. a sense, we're doing the same thing. No, the council's voting on on the new member, not the citizens. <coughs> and whoever wins the seat, when that term is up, I think you said it was like three, three, three and a half plus. years, uh, then at that time, that person, if they choose to run, would have to face the voters. 
because I could see it being her all night to interview two, three, four people. Uh, like I say, let's see how many we get, and then we can sit down and decide which way we want to go. Go ahead, Kat. If, if that subject's done, I, I actually went looking for a drone ordinance because we've been talking about mm -hmm. that, and it was worrisome to me. I don't like the idea of, I don't know, somebody in my yard with a machine that's taking pictures and... You know, I don't know what's going on in Going my yard. Yeah, I, so I'm going to pass <laughs> this ordinance out to you. You're not allowed to shoot them down. It's oh, against the law. Gauge, yeah. You're not allowed to. Yeah, well, but, I'll take the penalty. <laughs> but you'd have to know it was out there. That's the thing. So I would like for us to look at this ordinance and maybe talk about it next week. This is stolen from another city. I will admit that. I did not um, write this. But it seemed to be a very logical, very common sense sort of thing and that's the kind of stuff I like so I would like for us to really take an interest and look at this and bring it around would you share with us which city this was you know I think it was Anna but uh, I honestly don't remember right now I'm pretty sure it was Anna Ohio okay. but I can't swear the only thing I could find was the FAA requirements right there is no protection for the individual for somebody doing that in their backyard and you know we don't shut our back windows at night we don't we live there's nobody behind us and, and we have a lot of land and I just we don't do that and I know just I don't know I feel real funny about my backyard it's, it's a very private place for me I fix my front yard up for my neighbors you know I keep my house nice but my backyard's kind of mine, and if it gets a little messy, that's on me. But I, it's on me. I can, I'm the one that it matters to. So that's kind of my thing. I don't know how much uh, time we'll have next week with the work session to whether or not we could include the uh, drone situation in that. I think it's going to all depend upon how much time we put toward the... Uh, I, I, when I was whispering to Jake what you guys were talking about that, if maybe when you talk to Jake Thursday mm -hmm. regarding your penalty stuff you want to look at, Jake's already got quite a few ordinances from other municipalities regarding drones mm -hmm. since the work from Mr. Bond stuff. Maybe you can talk to Jake about that because you can always bring that ordinance to council with your name on it. I don't. Well, that's in what your, I was in your research, to they, do with they this. don't vary much from city to city, do they? No, they do not. They're pretty. They're pretty yeah, much. Yeah, this same. is that's a basic. That's why I thought it was good. So for I don't. Us. What I'm saying is, I don't think you guys are going to do much more past what's already out there, because I think it's governed by certain laws, correct? That we can't manipulate or change. Oh uh, yeah, I mean, there's the FAA, yeah. and then the state of Ohio. There, there's been legislation introduced, but I don't know if it's going to go anywhere. So. Um, but I mean, we could follow what other municipalities have done to make a point. Yeah. Well, right, you does know, anybody have anything else? Well, I, let me no, let me ahead. talk. Um, just a second. It's real important to me, and as a city, we pick other laws and requirements that are important to us as a city. I really think there's going to be enough people in this town that are going to be interested. That we shouldn't really care what the state of Ohio does when they do it which they are talking about changing and making some rules and regulations. Already there's things about like they're not allowed to fly in the parks and I didn't even know that. But I don't know why they don't have a right to fly in the parks but they have a right to fly in mine and your and your and your and everybody's backyard. That doesn't seem logical to me. But I do want to offer this up as an ordinance and I will talk to Jake and we'll get it written up correctly to be a ordinance next week or next two weeks right, we're having a work session next week <coughs> that was on the, the, on the 12th yes okay and I assume uh, I forgot about it. <laughs> mrs. Barner will put an ad in mm -hmm. um, did you, are you is it the CIP is that on the agenda to discuss no. this what's mm -hmm. on the agenda for the work session um, it's not necessary yeah, deal with really okay General city business. Before we break, I'd like to mention something about that work session. Work session on the twelfth. Can I say what I gotta say about that? I will not be able to attend. 
Um, we've had plans for months on that day. It's a highly expensive dinner. Um, so I cannot, I can't not miss that. Um, so what I've done is my personal schedule has always done things on the second, fourth Mondays because it's council meeting the first and third. Okay. So I have that locked out since those work sessions are relatively new. Send Colleen a, a note to deduct from your pay. I will have her do that, sir. But I at least wanted people to know I felt, I felt bad just because it's my job, but at the same time, too, it's already scheduled. So again, I cleared out my personal well, calendar now in a second. The only, the only thing I'm concerned about, I think there are quite a few things or questions sure. in regard to the CIP. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, what I said about CIP earlier was, well, you guys can sit on it. And at the meeting, a regular meeting when Colleen's here on the 19th, we'll set a work session to discuss the operating budget and the CIP. Mr. Mayor. Go ahead, Bill. Uh, since there's a scheduling contract with the manager's schedule, why don't we scrap next week's work session and move it to the 26th <coughs> or have a little bit of an extended meeting on the 19th and do it all at one time? The CIP, I don't think will take that long because it, it isn't a big humongous thing anymore. Uh, either that or I didn't get all of it, one of the two. You know, the CIP just sit on it for a while we're going to talk about that when we talk about the operating budget there's we can go and talk about CIP now but we don't know what the budget is going to look like until we close out more of the year so um, it's kind of pointless to talk about the CIP so early um, because it'll probably change I know that we wanted to talk about the retreat stuff so I think that's very important so would council mind changing it to the 26th? Because if we discuss the findings of the retreat, that may take some time. But I think that is a much needed discussion between council and administration. I don't have a problem change, moving it to the 20, 26th. What's the rest of council? Does that work better for you? Yeah, I mean, I can't miss that hard dinner. That's okay, a, yeah, yeah. I can't. yeah, that's fine. So Thank you want to change the work session very, to the very 26th. Do we need a motion for that? Or just Let's do that. Yeah. Okay. I move to Second. make a motion to change the work session from August 12th to August 26th, 6 p.m. at Heritage at Heritage. Second. Hall, whatever this place is called. <laughs> Councilwoman Wright. Everybody yes. Here? No, I am. Councilman Lindsay. Yes. Vice Mayor Eggleston. Yes. Mayor Cook. Yes. Councilman Bond. Yes. Councilman Shammy. Yes. That's a six. Mr. Mayor, move to adjourn. If nothing wait else. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Go ahead. Um, since Dale was the one who came up with the name of Heritage Hall, I thought maybe we could do a picnic table or a bench out front in his memory, have a plaque on it. Any thoughts? I wouldn't be for down for that. I, 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 I like Dale a lot, I really do, but I think we've had council members that have been here a lot longer than Dale that they don't receive any special notice or anything. And, I, you know, like I know there's a firefighter that's retired or retiring very mm -hmm. soon, and we don't take any notice of them either. But, you know, I don't know. I think maybe we need to start taking some notice of people who show longevity to our city. And, you know, I'd like to do something for Dale. I'm not sure what that is. And maybe that's good for a picnic table. I don't know. But I'm afraid the kids would deface it. Mm -hmm. Maybe just hold off a little bit. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Any further comment? Go ahead, Chief. Not on that, sir. Just a reminder to the citizens that the fire department will be starting hydrant flushings this week and will be starting in Area A. Hydrant flushing? So if you've got brown water, let it run. Mm -hmm. Don't drink it. Don't drink the brown water. <laughs> Other than that, did I hear a motion to adjourn? You did. Move Second. to adjourn. Councilwoman Wright? Yes. Councilman Lindsey? Yes. Vice Mayor Eggleston? Yes. Mayor Cook? Yes. Councilman Bond? Yes. Councilman Shammy? Yes. 
motion to adjourn. 6-0.